Bienvenidos a esta conversación organizada por el Hey Festival en colaboración con El País y con el apoyo del Grupo Sura. Hoy hablamos de los retos del clima. Estamos con Cristiana Figueres, bienvenida Cristiana, antropóloga y economista costarricense y Tom Rivet Cornack, eh, welcome Tom, eh, consultor, estratega político que se ha centrado sobre todo en el estudio del cambio climático. Escribieron juntos eh, El futuro por decidir, un libro sobre la crisis climática y cómo afrontarla, cómo sobrevivir a ella. Ambos fueron decisivos para la redacción de los Acuerdos del Clima de 2016, que incluyen un conjunto de acciones y recomendaciones para reducir las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero. Hoy contestarán a las preguntas de la audiencia y analizarán los desafíos a los que nos enfrentamos. Cristiana, Tom, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. So the first question is from Guillermo Ortiz from Spain. The pandemic has been disastrous in many ways, but it has also shown that massive societal change is possible when faced with a real threat. So what we can learn from the response to the pandemic that we can apply to the real threat to climate change. Tom, you want to take it? <laughs> no, after you. <laughs> um, bueno, primero, gracias por la pregunta. Thank you very much for, for the question. It, it is a question that uh, many people are grappling with because, as, uh, as we know, it has been a very, very difficult year in, uh, in the year 2020. However, um, every day it seems that uh, we realize that there are lessons to be learned out of the pandemic that are applicable to climate, but also to other challenges that we face. Um, the, the first and very evident is that any global challenge, any global emergency, any global crisis requires a global approach that it's not something that you can do country by country, city by city, person by person. We actually do need an all hands on board approach for the pandemic, but also um, for climate change. The second lesson that has already been, um, been um, uh, uh, already mentioned is the fact that we as humans, once we are convinced that there is a threat that we deem to be important enough we can make radical changes in our behavior and we can do so quite quickly. And uh, for climate change, we also have to make pretty deep changes and we have to make them pretty deeply because we have to be at one half the current global level of emissions by 2030. Now, the difference between the changes that we made uh, for the pandemic and the changes that we have to make in climate change are actually quite remarkable because um, the, the pandemic certainly took a very, very hard toll on lives and livelihoods. And for most other people, the pandemic resulted in sacrifices of quality of life, either through locking yourself in or not seeing your parents, your grandparents, your grandchildren. And in order to address climate change, we have to make radical behavior changes, but those actually end up in improving the quality of life because you would be able to cut out inefficiencies out of your electric system, out of your life. You would have better, um, better transport. You certainly, uh, we will certainly have cleaner air and more livable cities. All of those changes in order to address climate change will actually affect us positively in our quality of life. So while there are several lessons learned from the pandemic, uh, there are also very marked contrasts to the behavioral changes that we had to make for the pandemic. This question is from Maria Nogueras from Peru. One of the biggest threats to making the change necessary is the destructive impact of conspiracy theories and fake news. So what needs to be done to overcome this threat? 
Great. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for the question. And this is just at the heart of so many things that we now need to change if we're going to get on top of this issue. It's re- it's a really timely um, and well-phrased question. So in order for society to do big things, we need at core to be able to agree on what a fact is. And once we can agree on what a fact is, then it is normal and necessary for us to have robust discussions over how we deal with that issue that emerges. And that's right and normal, and we should welcome that multiplicity of of conversations. However, the challenge comes when there is so much noise and so much misinformation in society that you can't even agree on the basic facts. And therefore, you end up having a conversation about what's true and what's not true, rather than what should be done about the particular thing that you can all agree is a necessary issue that requires a response. One of the things that I have missed over the years is a sort of thoughtful dialogue on climate change between people who think something should be done, but they think it from different political perspectives, economic perspectives. We've now reached a point where our society is just awash with conspiracy theories, and it can be quite challenging to figure out what to do about it. But we have to figure out what to do about it if we're going to be able to come together and deal with this issue in a timely fashion. So I think there's three different levels where something has to be done. And I would start, honestly, at the individual level. All of us have a propensity for certain points of view, and we need to challenge ourselves to actually assess whether any particular bit of information is real or not. I myself um, have lots of friends who, uh, who, who, who may believe in climate science, but they doubt other kinds of science, whether it's to do with vaccines or, or whatever else it may be. And actually, we need to be really disciplined about adhering to a science-based view of the world and trusting science. I mean, as somebody who has spent much of my career trying to help people understand the risks of not listening to science, and we've all experienced the risks of that during the pandemic, we need to adhere to that even when it doesn't conform to our previously held beliefs. And we need to be critical of ourselves. If we come across information, how do we know that's true? That's on all of us. Secondly, we do need to see much more robust, proactive action from those companies that are often now the gatekeepers of information. There's a small number of companies that control social media networks, that do other, um, that are real gatekeepers in today's world in terms of where information is coming from. We are beginning to see them flex their muscles around realizing that they have some responsibility to ensure that they don't allow misinformation to just spread like wildfire through society. That needs to accelerate. And finally, we're going to get to the point where we need government regulation on this. Now, that's hard because it's a new challenge and it needs to be structured in such a way that it's actually effective. But we're, I think right now in the EU, um, uh, in Canada and in other parts of the world, we're seeing really serious attempts to, th- to think through what does that regulation look like? And that can only be welcomed and that has to go further. This is from Fernanda Restrepo uh, from United States of America. How effective really are the UN agreements to tackle the environmental emergency? Well, what a good question, Uh, Fernanda, what a good question. So um, I cannot conceive of a world without the United Nations because there has to be a multilateral platform where all national governments can come together to have fruitful conversations about all issues, all issues. However, we have to understand the limitation of the United Nations. The United Nations is a platform for conversation. It is a platform for agreements that are reached by those countries. The United Nations per se does not have the um, the mandate to force any country to do anything that that country does not want to do. That is not what the United Nations were created for. The United Nations is created as a dialogue table, as a multilateral collaborative effort. But what is decisive in the United Nations are the decisions of the national governments. And it is once there is a decision of national governments, such as in the Paris Agreement, then it is the nations themselves that keep each other accountable to whatever was agreed. So it is a a strange, I must say, it's much more of a facilitative role that the United Nations plays 
rather than an enforcement role. Unless, of course, countries have agreed to give the United Nations an enforcement role in any agreement. That is not the case under the Paris Agreement. It is actually much more of a roadmap, if you will. Countries, all countries have actually agreed that the Paris Agreement will be a roadmark, a roadmap toward the decarbonization of the global economy until we get to net zero by 2050. And there are definitely milestones that will be touched every five years in which all countries must come to the table to be transparent about what they have done and especially to commit to each other how much more they're going to do over the next five years. But as I say, the role of the United Nations, certainly in the case of the Paris Agreement, but also um, in most other cases in the United Nations, is much more of a facilitative role rather than a policing or enforcement role. So, so Christiana, can I ask you, if that's the case, is it possible that when President Trump pulled the United States out of the Paris Agreement, he didn't understand what the Paris Agreement was? I mean, how could that have been? Well, that's that's the fun thing, right? I think so many things are fun that um, that he said while he was there because uh, he did claim that the United Nations or that other countries had forced the United the, the United States to do something against its interest or against its will. And the fact is that the United States one was was one of the most active negotiating teams uh, for the Paris Agreement. And you can see many different ways in which the Paris Agreement uh, was influenced by, uh, by the United States. And it was ultimately adopted very much on a voluntary and an exciting and willing way by the United States at that point, um, signed by John Kerry, who was Secretary of State. So the fact, you know, that, uh, sorry, it's not a fact. No, it is a fact that he said, <laughs> the fact that Trump said that um, that the United States was forced into something that they didn't agree with is simply not a fact. To come back to Tom's point about it's very important to know the difference between fact and myth. There you go. <laughs> this question is from Isabel Garcia from Mexico. Can you share with us examples of successful policies or schemes that have been applied in specific places to mitigate the effects of climate change? Bueno, Itzel, eh, muchas gracias. Eh, yes, eh, yes, many actually. Um, and some of them are policies, some of them are actually more price signals. Uh, and some of those price signals are indirectly affected by policy. But everything to do with the incentives that are being given on, for example, cities uh, regulating that as of a certain year, they will no longer allow for vehicles of internal combustion engines. Those are policy decisions that cities or countries are taking that are sending very, very clear market signals to the auto manufacturing companies to indicate to them that it's probably not very good business to continue to invest in the production of internal combustion engines and that they should be shifting their capital over to non-emitting vehicles, such as electric vehicles, if we're talking about light vehicles, or in fact, even in the case of trucks and, and heavy transport over to um, other types of, uh, of uh, heavy transport, such as green hydrogen. So you see that there is a very interesting combination between policy decisions that definitely come from the top, but that have a bottom up reaction because companies begin to react to those policy signals. And that is true in the, um, in the transport um, area. It's also true in the energy uh, generation system when you have countries that give incentives to the generation of, uh, of renewable energy. And then, for example, in, in India, and then you see much more solar energy coming into the system. And staying with India, just because I, I was um, reading something about India this morning, 
how interesting is it that you have a policy signal that um, that allows for those owners of motorcycles to change their very contaminating and loud motorcycle, change it over to an electric vehicle. And, and then you have a smart business model of exchange of batteries that makes those motorcycles actually very accessible to so many people. So, um, so whether it is in transport, whether it is in energy generation, whether uh, whether it is um, in 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 two wheel transport or four wheel or or heavy transport, the fact is that we are seeing more and more policies that are being adopted in uh, either the state level, the city level or the national level that are moving us toward decarbonization. Now, that is good news, but we have to rem remember that it is not deep enough, the change that we're seeing, the transformation, and that we actually need much, much, many more policies and more effective and deeper cutting policies in order to be able to send the market signals to corporations so that you can have government and private sector work together at, um, at a much more accelerated pace. This question is from Angela Trujillo from Peru. The Paris Agreement also needs to be reinforced and communicated within communities. So how would you suggest to be instrument of good if we do not find the support of our own communities if there is not even a sign of need to implement special policies to enhance the need of conservation, to avoid pollution, to change our metal patterns. So how do we do beyond our own desire? Um, so I, I think that's a question about how do we help um, our communities, how do we become agents of change within our own communities, be there our physical communities or our work communities or our communities of interest, to try to help them move us towards a regenerative future? And, and, and it's a great question because often what we find is that the level of realization about the scale of the emergency that we are facing, and this is amazing really given how long we've known about it, but, but still there is not that level of education and understanding from people about what we're now facing, right? And we're now in the most decisive decade in human history. It's not an exaggeration to put it like that, but it really sounds like it is. Um, and given that we all have a responsibility to do multiple things. Um, first of all, to actually focus on our own footprint and that of our immediate family, that can be very significant in and of itself. Um, but also, it enables us to feel like we're more engaged in the issue and we are, and evidence has shown that people who look at their own carbon footprint are much more likely to then take further action in other things that I'm about to describe. The second is around the area of our influence and that can extend to our communities. What role can we play in our communities to precipitate transformations, community scale, renewable projects, uh, conversations with stakeholders, with business leaders, with community leaders, others, taking that role, which can sometimes feel a bit lonely, um, in order to try to be out there and say, this is the moment we have to step up. And actually what, what I have found and what many people that I've spoken to since writing this book and talking about it have found is that actually people want to be called to do something big at this critical moment. If you dig in and say, this is our chance to really show up and do a big thing in our community, such as we're able to at an appropriate scale, then people like being called to that. And holding that space can often really resonate with people in a really profound way. So I would encourage the questioner and anyone else listening to really take that opportunity to be that beacon of hope, to say, we can do this. This is our chance. We won't drop the ball on our watch. And to hold that perspective that can really make a major change. Um, and then the third thing is to think much more broadly about our role as a voter or, 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 or in any other way in society. So I would encourage everybody to think about that, what our own emissions are and that of our immediate family. How do we influence our community and how do we influence a national scale? We need to show up in all of those roles in order to make this transformation. And actually, once you start doing it, it becomes easier and easier to make more progress.
The last question is from Claudia Vasquez from Colombia. She asked if is there a strategy you can share, any special case with good result that you can share, especially in communities not very conscious about the subject. You know, Tom and I don't really believe in preaching at people because we don't think um, it gets very far. Uh, to speak to people by asking them questions about, um, for example, um, what's their electric bill like? How are they, how are they, do they know how that electricity is being generated? Do they know what the air pollution levels are if they live in a city that their children are being exposed to? Uh, how long are they commuting in completely inefficient transport systems? Just asking questions to raise awareness about living conditions that we're all living in that we shouldn't be living in anymore, that have honestly become obsolete with respect to the technologies that are available to give us much better living conditions. We have much better, much better um, technologies for energy generation, for energy use, for transport, for health, for quality of air. Those are all available to us. And so we're probably not going to change things unless we are made aware of the fact that we are living under conditions that are suboptimal and that we have better alternatives. So to take it, especially to someone who is not aware of the global implications, to take it straight to their own daily experience is one way to begin to at least pique their curiosity around what could be better. And then to help them make the link that having a better human health is also better for the planet. And the best example of that is eating habits. And unfortunately in Latin America, we are still eating a lot of red meat. That frankly is not good for our personal health and it's not good for the planetary health. So to understand that we can actually, we have full control over what we eat and we can start diminishing animal-based protein and increase plant-based protein in our diets because that's going to make us much more healthy, how it gives us better energy, allows us to have a better weight control. Um, all of that is actually totally within our control. And in so doing, we're actually helping the planetary health because the production of meat, especially cattle, is um, dependent to a great extent on deforestation, which causes climate change. So to make the link for people between our personal living conditions, our personal health, and the planetary conditions and planetary health is actually quite helpful. But I definitely recommend that you start with where is that person? Meet them where they are. Don't take them straight to planetary health or planetary conditions because that may not mean anything to them to begin with. So you have to ask questions, meet them where they are, and help them raise their awareness about their own contributions and their own responsibility toward their own living conditions. Christiana Tom, thank you so much for this conversation. If, we, if you want to say something to our community of uh, Imagina el Mundo, Imagine the World, you're welcome. Well, so thank you very much, Francesco. Thank you for, um, for guiding us through this conversation. Uh, and thank you to the Latin American audience, to whom we can say that we're excited that the book is out in Spanish, currently in Spain, but soon coming to Latin America. Here it is. Da. Thanks so much. Bye. Acabamos de escuchar a Cristiana Figueres y a Tom River Cornack, que nos acaba de enseñar eh, el futuro por decidir eh, 
la cubierta del libro que acaba de, acaban de escribir, ambos, sobre la crisis climática y los retos que, que nos plantea a los que nos enfrenta el cambio climático. Eh, les invitamos a eh, seguir en contacto con la comunidad de Imagina el Mundo. Muchísimas gracias por habernos acompañado hoy en esta conversación. Eh, y hasta la próxima. Thank mm -hmm. you.